Good morning, everyone. This is Mark Erkin and um, welcome you to our Friday morning program. Um, we have a great uh, topic and a great um, presentation and discussion to, that will take place this morning on a very timely um, topic in thyroidology. Uh, it is really a pleasure to introduce Dr. Samantha Newman, who is an endocrinologist at Hackensack University Medical Center in New Jersey. Um, she definitely got a flavor of the different medical centers in the greater New York area, which included um, her training in internal medicine um, at NYU. Uh, she spent a year um, as chief resident in internal medicine at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and then uh, moved across town to do a fellowship um, in endocrinology at Mount Sinai. Um, she has uh, served under two excellent mentors in Mike Tuttle and Dr. Terry Davies. Um, and this morning she will be presenting some of the work um, related to uh, her time with Dr. Tuttle. Our discussant uh, this morning comes uh, to us live from across the pond. Dr. Ricard Simo is a consultant otolaryngologist uh, as well as head, neck and thyroid surgeon at Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital in London. At Guy's in St. Thomas, he heads up both the head, neck, and thyroid surgical services. He is widely published and has had a wonderful academic career. He has held key leadership positions, including uh, the past president of the European Laryngological Society. He is um, editor of Journal of ENT Masterclass, as well as head, neck coordinator of the European Board Exam in Otolaryngology. Um, and so with that, um, I want to encourage everyone to send in your questions um, uh, through the Q&A, and we will try to get to those by the end of the session. Um, really encourage you to um, uh, raise questions regarding the presentation, and we'll do our best to uh, finish up by 9 o'clock. So with that, I welcome um, uh, uh, Samantha and uh, Ricard, and um, look forward to your talks here. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Sorry for the delay. There we go. Okay. So thank you guys so much for having me. It's a pleasure. I attended these uh, lectures as a fellow. And so it's been a very, very significant part of my training. So it's definitely an honor to be here. I wanted to um, uh, start by just uh, saying that I have no financial disclosures. <laughs> So just for a little bit of background on sort of why we started this project. So thyroid nodules and therefore thyroid cancers are becoming increasingly identified due to the high tendency of clinicians to image at this stage in medicine. Um, I personally get tons of referrals for thyroid nodules from people who got a carotid ultrasound, a neck CT, a C-spine MRI. Uh, very, sometimes even just a plain text, uh, test x-ray, um, all of these nodules, or, or most of them are incidentally noted once in a while, they'll be felt on exam. Um, but the recognition of them is increasingly uh, prevalent. Um, because, and so many of these thyroid, uh, papillary thyroid cancers are thought to be low risk, and therefore active surveillance is becoming an increasingly accepted management strategy. Um, that is currently supported by the American Thyroid Association. Some centers will you know, uh, have various guidelines, but some will go up to uh, a 1.5 centimeter tumor that they're willing to sort of expectantly observe. And so um, Dr. Tuttle and a lot of the, um, the, the folks at, at Sloan Kettering, where I did my chief resident year, have sort of uh, been pioneers in this attempt um, to have this active management strategy accepted. Um, and they, they kind of have this foundation of three domains that you need to consider when, consi when um, um, choosing this strategy for your patients. And one is tumor characteristics, patient characteristics, and medical team characteristics. And with reference to number one, which is what we'll talk about mostly today, the location and where the tumor falls relative to the um, recurrent laryngeal nerve. 
Okay, so this is actually lifted directly from one of Dr. Tuttle's um, previous um, talks um, that just specifies what is meant by each of these elements. So medical team characteristics, how good is your ultrasound, how good is your team of surgeons and um, and uh, and endocrinologists with experience in thyroidology, and um, how good is uh, is your program set up to expectantly manage? Do you have a compliant patient population? Do you have the ability to see pe people frequently and follow up? With regards to actual clinical findings and imaging, which we'll talk about more uh, a little bit later on. Um, things uh, such as the tumor size, the location, and how fast it grows. So is the uh, size of the nodule doubling within six months? Um, does it extend out of the thyroid? Uh, obviously, if there are metastases, whether to the neck or elsewhere in the body, um, and is there any other or abnormalities noted on ultrasound? And finally, characteristics of your patient, and this is sort of where the art of medicine comes in. Is this a patient who is going to um, I uh, have difficulty with a surgery, difficulty with a surgical recovery. Is this a patient who's anxious and cannot bear the thought of having a cancer in their neck that they're not handling? Um, and do they have the appropriate support from their medical team and their families? All these things are uh, considered. Okay, moving on. So what is appropriate for an active surveillance uh, approach? So um, basically, when we think about this, the thing, the first thing that always comes to my mind, maybe uh, it, before I had done this research was size. So the thought is that, a, first of all, asymptomatic nodules and small. So the thought was less than one centimeter um, or now up to less than 1.5 centimeter confined to the thyroid and surrounded by normal thyroid tissue are acceptable for following, uh, for management with active surveillance. Um, and this applies to with or without confirming the actual cytopathology of the nodule um, in people who want to avoid surgery. So this is people with um, who are resistant to the surgery, who are uh, medically uh, with comorbidities not appropriate for surgery, um, and who really uh, or people who are not interested in potentially having to take long-term levothyroxine replacement, that is people who um, want an intact thyroid. And so conversely, what tumors are not appropriate for an active surveillance approach? So um, people whose tumors are number one, larger, so larger than 1.5 uh, or even two centimeters, and then tumors in this subcapsular location near important structures. So tumors that abut the trachea, tumors that um, are in the path of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, or tumors that are growing quickly. So um, if they are doubling in size in less than two years, they're considered inappropriate for observation, um, and a more aggressive strategy is warranted. And so why did we focus on recurrent laryngeal nerve invasion? Well, so it's, you know, essentially considered by the, the American Joint Commission on, um, on cancer and, and uh, the TNM staging system to be a, a negative prognostic factor. It's also ir uh, associated with an irreversible um, uh, effect. So typically once the vocal cord uh, or once the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve is damaged, um, this isn't a, uh, a, a fixable problem uh, intraoperatively or otherwise normally. I'm sure our um, surgical discussant can uh, add to this at, at a later point, but this is, a, this is an irreversible problem. Okay, so just a little bit of an anatomy review here. The um, uh, and part of why um, we focused on this topic. So the uh, just the left recurrent laryngeal nerve sort of arises from the vagus nerve. It loops around the aortic arch um, and the ligamentum arteriosum, and then it ascends kind of right next to um, the trachea on the left side. Um, and, um, and, and kind of passes the, the thyroid gland in sort of this space, so this tracheoesophageal groove. Um, and so, it, so it's not surprising that tumors that would compromise the nerve um, really are along this medial aspect of the left lobe of the thyroid, sort of um, right in, in that groove. So that, that is not surprising. What is 
less obvious um, on imaging and clinically is the course of the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. So first of all, it's unpredictable and differs in, in uh, from person to person. But typically, after it arises from the right vagus nerve, um, it sort of loops around the uh, subclavian artery kind of more laterally and then ascends kind of below the right lower pole. Um, of the thyroid gland um, and, and then moves to the lateral from lateral to medial up the thyroid lobe and then it meets the trachea. So it's not quite as clear with tumors in the right, uh, the right lobe of the thyroid uh, where right uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve compromise will occur. And so what was our purpose? And basically it was to identify the specific uh, uh, thyroid subcapsular locations that are associated with the greatest risk of nerve invasion and to allow clinicians to better identify tumors that aren't suitable for this active uh, surveillance management strategy. Um, and so how did we do this? Um, so we identified 30 patients with preoperative um, uh, and or intraoperative evidence of gross uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve invasion from a small primary tumor that, have, uh, that would have otherwise been thought of as appropriate for uh, active surveillance. So I was very fortunate to um, spend my chief year at Sloan Kettering, which has a massive um, surgical database from which we could draw a lot of information. Um, and basically over 4,000 patients were uh, sort of assessed initially um, from having a, a surgery um, between 1986 and 2015. And we identified from that over 4,123 patients who had gross uh, extrathyroidal extension involving one of the recurrent uh, laryngeal nerves. Um, this was identified, so extrathyroidal extension was identified either preoperatively by imaging or clinical symptoms such as voice hoarseness, vocal cord paralysis seen on laryngoscopy, um, or intraoperatively by the surgeon. And so then we further said, okay, of these 23 patient, 123 patients, how many of them had small tumors that we would have considered? Because if you have a five centimeter tumor, nobody's watching nobody's watching and waiting. Um, but so how many of these people had tumors less than two centimeters? And we had, uh, and that was 39. A few patients had to be excluded for um, a, a series of other reasons. Mostly uh, it was that their uh, uh, nerve damage had occurred from either uh, an, an external cause or most often a um, uh, a metastatic lymph node, which we didn't count. Um, and then, so in the end, 30 patients were included uh, in, in our analysis. And in our chart review, we, we essentially looked at clinical or radiographic evidence of extrathyroidal extension, and also a lot of operative reports from surgeons that, are, that had commentary on the location of the extrathyroidal extension or the um, uh, invasion of the nerve. And so what did we find? So just a brief um, uh, comment on the characteristics of our patients. So, um, you know, it was, it was actually quite rare uh, to see tumors less than two centimeters uh, invading the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So it was only a total of 35 out of, out of over 4,000 screened. Um, then this is of all people with primary, um, uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma who underwent surgery at Sloan Kettering um, between 1986 and 2015. And so um, of this, the median age of diagnosis was 55. The median tumor diameter was 1.6 centimeters, although we'll look at the full distribution in the next slide. Um, and then surprisingly, 76% of patients were female. It's a little bit outside of the scope of discussion of why um, that there, there's so such a female prevalence, perhaps it has to do with the fact that females are more willing to um, manage uh, their, uh, their condition aggressively than males, but that's purely speculative. Um, so all patients in, these, uh, in this group that we assessed had evidence of extrathyroidal extension. 
100% uh, invaded the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve. That was um, part of our inclusion criteria. But a series of other um, uh, structures were invaded. The tracheo in 50%, esophagus in 40%, um, fibroadipose tissue, strap muscle, and larynx in fewer. The vast majority, in, ter in terms of pathology, the vast majority was classical PTC at 50% with tall cell following behind. Um, and then um, just uh, uh, worth noting that um, in terms of the way that the um, patients were evaluated, so most patients underwent um, a, a total thyroidectomy, or about 93%. Um, and um, pretty much all patients had evidence of during the surgery of gross extrathyroidal extension. Okay, so in terms of the tumor uh, imaging characteristics, so the preoperative imaging was um, a relatively even split between ultrasound and CT. And an important point here is that neither method was actually success, very sensitive in detecting nerve invasion. Um, direct uh, visualization of the vocal cords was documented in almost all the patients, 28 out of the 30, and only nine had, um, had cord paralysis that was, that was observed. Served. Um, so the majority had uh, totally normal vocal cord dis dysfunction on direct uh, vocal cord function, rather, on direct laryngoscopy, despite then having nerve invasion intraoperatively. You see in the graph here um, the distribution of tumor size. So the smallest tumors that we captured that invaded the recurrent laryngeal nerve was 0.9 centimeters in diameter, um, and the largest was two centimeters. Um, with the distribution as follow, uh, you know, as explained here. So this is sort of um, kind of like the meat of the paper, which is basically um, that so gross invasion of the recurrent laryngeal nerve um, is associated with um, essentially a subscap a subcapsular primary tumor in one of these three locations. Um, all of our patients had to, that had nerve invasion, their tumors were in one of, were in only these three locations, the right paratracheal in about 60% um, and the left paratracheal in 37% and only one patient who was a 41 year old female who had a completely normal uh, vocal cord exam and a, um, you know, and neck metastases wound up having um, uh, intraoperative findings of gross invasion of the right nerve in the right lateral posterior lobe um, that did not appear at all on Im preoperative imaging studies. So the you can see the vast majority of the tumors did occur in these um, uh, uh, areas that abut the trachea. Okay, so this is just some representative images of um, ultrasound findings in each location. So um, in A, you can see a, a ultrasound, um, a, a 0.9 centimeter um, uh, pair, uh, PTC tumor that's in the transverse view and the longitudinal view in, um, in uh, frame B. And then um, in the next row, C and D, you see a, a one centimeter midpole tumor. And in E and F, you see a, a 1.5 centimeter, sorry, no, this is a 1.1 centimeter tumor in E and F in both the transverse and longitudinal views. G and H is a 1.5 centimeter tumor and I and J is a 1.2 centimeter tumor. Uh, so you can essentially see the various locations that we're talking about. If you're looking at on, you know, particularly on the transverse view, um, you can see all of these tumors are right, appear to be abutting the trachea with very little normal thyroid tissue in between. I'd say basically I is sort of the exception to that. Um, but um, all of these tumors show characteristic signs of papillary thyroid carcinoma. They have irregular borders. They have microcalcifications within, and especially this nice one uh, in H, um, and it's sort of just a series of representative samples of the areas that we're talking about.
Okay, so what are what did we learn from sort of doing this study? And basically, um, we sort of confirmed our hypothesis that these tumors that are less than two centimeters that ran the course of the recurrent laryngeal nerve um, were, you know, kind of at higher risk of uh, nerve invasion. And these occur in the left paratracheal. Uh, right paratracheal, left paratracheal, and right lateral posterior area of the thyroid. And so um, in terms of the, the one that to, to me is of most significant interest is this right lateral posterior area. So it's, it's really, it, it's not surprising that tumors that involve the thyroid capsule at the paratracheal interface are concerning. This is the predicted course of the nerve. But the right lateral posterior aspect of the thyroid is not was had not really been previously considered um, in in criteria for exclusion of this active management strategy. Um, is, so it's important to recognize, I think, that um, because of the course of the nerve behind the thyroid right here, you do run the risk of nerve invasion. Um, the problem with this from clinically uh, clinical perspective is that it's very difficult to predict the course of the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve in person to person as it varies. It's also very hard to identify the recurrent laryngeal nerve by ultrasound. Um, and there's there's significant amount of inherent variability and poor and poor imaging techniques. Um, so therefore, basically tumors that are in contact with the thyroid capsule at this uh, juncture on the the right lateral posterior side of the thyroid are probably not are, are probably poor candidates for active surveillance, uh, you know, ultimately. Okay, so then what else did we conclude so Basically, in all the patients we observed, tumors less than 0.9 centimeters were not observed to invade the recurrent laryngeal nerve, regardless of location. Um, and, and so and this, the smallest known, this is, this is consistent with other findings in the literature, which, which cite the smallest known tumor to invade the recurrent laryngeal nerve is around 0.7 centimeters. Um, but while active surveillance is currently considered for tumors up to 1.5 centimeters, this study sort of suggests that maybe we should revise that um, to, to less than one centimeter, depending on location. Um, the size, obviously, as we've said, the size and location of the tumor is should be considered as distinct but related, um, and and both important in um, in considering selection of patients for this strategy. Um, and then another very important point is that preoperative radiology studies and clinical findings are not predictive of nerve involvement at the time of surgery. So only 25% of our patients had any suggestion of um, uh, extrathyroidal extension on imaging findings, and only 30% had vocal cord paralysis. So if we rely too heavily on these strategies to reassure patients to make our management decisions, then it, uh, it, we do run the risk of missing people who ha may have a uh, adverse outcome because of their tumor. Um, so the limitation to this point, however, is that our patients weren't identified or evaluated as candidates for active surveillance. So when we selected our patients, we selected people who we already knew had extrathyroidal extension. So the normal workup for active surveillance wasn't performed. In particular, the close attention was not paid to how much normal thyroid tissue was around each tumor um, and, and uh, patient characteristics such as that. So this wasn't a study about, you know, that evaluated candidates for active surveillance. Um, final thoughts. Clearly, uh, this is very, very much a, a demonstrating that medicine is an art, right? The guidelines here even sort of hint at that, right? People may be able to observe their small papillary cancers. They definitely are not definitively able to, right? It's who is the patient? What is the risk of surgery? What is the chance of mortality from prime uh, from papillary thyroid cancer versus something else? Clearly one size does not fit all. I was saying before we um, started recording here that I tell all my patients who come in or the vast majority who come in with these small nodules that I think are papillary thyroid cancer, I tell them, look, 
look, this is worth investigating, but you're probably not going to die from this, right? You're probably going to die from something else. And that is something that you have to think about in terms of management strategy. Um, next uh, thing to think about. So 0.9 centimeters was the smallest um, tumor that in our study, which was relatively small, that invaded the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, but we all know that uh, ultrasound imaging is technologist dependent and very imprecise. You can twist your hand the tiniest bit and all of a sudden your tumor is 0.8 centimeters, one centimeter. So how, what, so what do we do now about a 0.8 centimeter tumor in one of these locations? Actually, I don't know, right? There's, this is where it kind of becomes a, a a shared decision making with the patient. I wouldn't necessarily be reassured by a 0.8 centimeter tumor in, a, in the tracheoesophageal groove. Um, finally, uh, or just the last couple points before I turn it over here, as we discussed, preoperative imaging and exam are unreliable to exclude right, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve invasion, cannot be relied on, and the location. So, um, Based on this work, I feel pretty confident in my own practice that anything in the tracheoesophageal groove or the right lower pole of the thyroid, posterior lower pole of the thyroid, I'm not particularly comfortable um, uh, just watching and waiting. Um, and with that, I will say thank you. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing our discussant's opinion. I have to stop sharing. <laughs> Thank you. I need to then share my screen, I guess. There we go. So, okay, so I guess that everybody can see my screen. Um, so um, first of all, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, Professor Erkin and, uh, and, and his team uh, at, at the Thank Foundation for, for this opportunity. It's uh, really, really great uh, to be able to have that, uh, you know, the part of this, this fantastic resource. So, so Gary Sia, who first uh, sent the invitation, then Michael, who uh, uh, set up all the, uh, all the technical uh, uh, issues, and, uh, and Camilo as well as a part of the team. So really, really great. So, so to, to me, uh, is is uh, is I've I've got the uh, the the uh, the task to to discuss uh, um, uh, Dr. Newsman uh, 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 paper uh, on the invasion of the recurrent laryngeal nerve for small, well differentiated thyroid cancers. Uh, and again, I don't have any conflict of interest. Um, um, and uh, and then the my uh, patient who are going to share uh, a small video, uh, she gave permission uh, to to share that video to, to the rest of the world. So this is uh, where, I, uh, where I live, uh, where I uh, work. Uh, this is Guy's Hospital. Uh, we have a really great pedigree on, in terms of kind of uh, 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 history of, of endocrinology and, and, and treating cancer. So William Gold was the first person uh, to describe uh, uh, hypothyroidism. Uh, Thomas Addison, uh, who described Addison's disease, was a physician from Guy's. Uh, so was uh, Thomas Hodgkins, who described uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. So we got a really, really great pedigree in terms of institution. And we are easily identified because we do have this uh, very big uh, building here, the tallest building in Europe, the Shard, and then our hospital is just next to it. So if you come to London, you are most welcome to come and visit us. So as a general comment about the, the paper, I think uh, 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 the paper is excellent. This is obviously is in the uh, keeping with the great tradition of, of, of papers coming from uh, the, the MSK is well written, is well structured, it answers the question. Um, and, and, and it is it is a retrospective study. And, and I think, uh, unfortunately, in terms of kind of uh, surgical research, um, we have to kind of uh, go with that retrospective um, uh, views. Um, but I think it does uh, add uh, new knowledge uh, to the current understanding about this, this uh, small but very badly behaved, uh, well differentiated thyroid cancer. So, and obviously that addresses the implications that these specific cancers, they cannot really be uh, uh, suitable for active surveillance. So I'd just uh, like to congratulate uh, Dr. Newman and uh, the team for, for such a fantastic uh, piece of work. But uh, I'd just like to kind of, uh, in a way, extrapolate some of the, uh, the implications of the paper. So I think in terms of kind of the surgical kind of approach to this, we are, there are implications for consent, um, as uh, they already been discussed about the preoperative planning, uh, and then obviously the imaging, the interpretive findings regarding the recurrent laryngeal nerve, um, how we do modify the techniques 
uh, the surgical technique in terms of kind of finding a, 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 a one of these uh, cancers, uh, then whether we will need to potentially kind of then do address the central compartment. Uh, and then and then what do we do if we find that the nerve is actually um, uh, completely involved? Um, what, what do we do in terms of kind of uh, dealing with that in terms of the reconstruction? So first of all, just about consent. I think obviously you need to, when we do have this, uh, this, this, this patients, uh, I think there is a, a probably slightly kind of a, a different discussion that we need to do. Obviously, the, the presence of external extension uh, it carries worse prognosis. Then there may be an option, a possibility that you may end up with an incomplete resection because you don't want to damage the nerve, and that may obviously carry carry worse prognosis. There's a controversy then in, in terms of the management, and then the need potentially of additional procedures, um, the additional mobility that these patients may have, uh, uh, and otherwise uh, a very straightforward uh, type of uh, thyroidectomy. So in terms of preoperative evaluation, I think uh, Dr. Newman has already addressed that, uh, and, and the limitations of. Uh, of, of that ultrasound, uh, which is obviously now the standard of care, uh, minimal evaluation. It's interesting to see that some of those patients in the paper didn't really have uh, all those complete evaluations. To me, I think it is extremely important that we do have, uh, uh, we're very thorough, um, we are very structured, um, and then we, all the patients who do have um, uh, undergo uh, thyroid surgery, and I think uh, the, the uh, the American guidelines, as well as our, our guidelines to do um, support uh, the use of preoperative fiber optic laryngoscopy is something that we do need to, we need to do. It provides a dynamic view, and it is now, nowadays it's become a medical legal uh, uh, investigation. Uh, so if then, if then, then we do have a doubt about, uh, about uh, the, the, the potentially uh, airway involvement, we may need to even proceed to a daring laryngoscopy. So the features of the, in the ultrasound are really well known to everybody. Um, and then we do may have that indication of that extra capsular uh, uh, spread. Uh, and, then, and then obviously the, the actual location of, of, of the tumor. So I think, if, I think the, this paper does address that. The, I think even if we do have uh, an understanding that uh, we cannot uh, see or identify the, uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve um, very logically as it may be, uh, one of the nerves, uh, uh, you know, for instance, the, the the facial nerve, you know, we do have a better kind of kind of potential kind of location in terms of whether it's actually involved or not with MRI scan. I think here we don't have that 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 addition. It's something that we do discuss often with the uh, our geology colleagues. So, um, I think if you do have that doubt, I think you do then need to kind of uh, add, uh, you know, a uh, high quality. Um, uh, 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 cross-sectional imaging, such as computerized tomography, with uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, contrast, which obviously uh, you know causes controversy about then the timing of the ray iodine, um, and then MRI scan that also is really good uh, is a good uh, soft tissue. Uh, 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 um, it provides a very soft, good soft tissue definition, but uh, but it does have a problem of, of motion artifact and then not necessarily defining uh, the planes as we would like to do uh, in in this sort of kind of situation. Then the, I guess the next thing is to is to find you know as as, as Dr Newman was 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 referring earlier about about interferon findings. I think obviously as as as, as in the preoperative. Uh, 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 or the pretreatment uh, uh, situation, we, we know where, where we are, but then it is different sometimes what we find intraoperatively. And then uh, this is, uh, you know, her findings are consistent with uh, probably quite of the rest of the very well published literature. And then the recurrent laryngeal nerve is really higher up there. And then, as, as she also uh, uh, said, is that the, the, the recurrent laryngeal nerve can be involved by the extra capsular spread within the thyroid or the, or the lymph nodes. And then they are specifically uh, address the extra capsular spread, not the lymph nodes. But really at the end of the day, that, that, that for us is, is, is kind of irrelevant because we still need to do with that, uh, with that recurrent laryngeal nerve involvement, uh, whether it's actually one or the other. And I think it is important that we do, we do uh, have that uh, really, really well addressed. In terms of kind of uh, the uh, structured sort of kind of uh, thinking, I think uh, you know, we, we should probably refer to this paper of, of the of the Randall group in in, uh, in 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 Boston, where we do have um, you know a, a really structured schema of 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 how we deal the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 with a recurrent laryngeal nerve based on the uh, uh, EMG, though, so the intraoperative uh, neuromonitoring at the time of, of of the surgery, and and that gives a very very good sort of kind of understanding as to how in general we should really proceed. 
So if we have a functioning nerve and we have a positive AMG, that's great. Uh, and if we find that the nerve is not invaded, but it's just very close, what we do is we do uh, have very close resection. For instance, here we do see this, uh, this kind of little kind of novel of, 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 of nerve uh, very close to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. We can leave, the, uh, leave the, 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 the nerve out, try to keep some of that vascularity, and then very closely um, shave the nerve. Uh, and I'm going to show a little video uh, regarding this. Um, we may need to, find, need to kind of find the nerve in, the, in a slightly different location. So we may need to find the, the nerve above it, the cricothyroid junction, then follow it down. Uh, and, then, and then also finding it uh, below, and then, and then getting to that kind of crucial point where there may be uh, embedded. Obviously, all this manipulation of the nurse will, will create a, a higher risk of post-operative neuropraxia, and that's what we were referring earlier about the consent. We need to really address uh, this with the, with, with the patient. I think that, that the fact that we do have that, that location issue, um, and that is something that we will probably need to say to the patient that uh, there may be a slightly more increased risk of neuropraxia. So, there were, however, some, uh, some situations where you have a functioning nerve. We do, we do have a positive ENG, uh, and then, but we do find that uh, there's absolutely no way. And then we're going to then end up having a, uh, a, a, an R2 resection where there may be kind of really a potential problem for the future because sometimes if there's a, uh, let's say, a, a, tall, a tall cell kind of uh, significant component that may not be a uh, that well uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sensitive to ray iodine, and then we may just find that this, 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 this tumor, they will recur, and then they will just certainly behave badly. So in this, in this sort of situation, we will recommend, obviously, that, uh, that the, the, the surgeons are prepared to do uh, intraoperative uh, uh, repair, uh, immediate intraoperative repair, which would um, uh, uh, help um, uh, um, uh, significantly the, the, the outcome of these patients. And I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about that a bit later on. However, if the patient, if the patient, if the patient has got a non-functioning nerve, either preoperatively or, uh, or on EMG, uh, I think obviously those nerves should be resected. Then you would normally, what we do is take frozen sections from the proximal distal stumps. And then we do tend to reconstruct as if possible. And, and the reason being is that there is evidence to suggest that the renovation it is actually better than the laryngoplasty at, at long term. So it is in, an important kind of aspect in terms of kind of surgical care. The other thing is that about how we do modify that surgical technique. And, and, and uh, you know, uh, Greg Randolph uh, uh, and uh, Ashok Shah uh, and uh, Professor Shah would, would, would tell you all about this. But uh, certainly, I think we do need to have all that surgical armamentarium here. Uh, definitely use interactive uh, neuromonitoring, and I think that's obviously controversial. But I think uh, all the guidelines now and all the evidence suggests that that's the best uh, that the, the, we need to use that. Obviously, we use power tools, uh, we use the loops, and then we do find that uh, 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 using uh, 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 micro instruments is a really, really uh, uh, great uh, uh, thing to do. This is just an example of, of how we do. Um, you know, find those very, very stuck nerves. How do will these stuck nerves? So we are using here a micro scissor. I'm trying to kind of uh, myself um, uh, contract and uh, provide as much extension so I can I can dissect that nerve in a in a very gentle way, and then take all those strands with a with a micro scissors. If you do have conventional instruments here, uh, it will be very difficult. So I think the the uses the use of uh, micro instrumentation is extremely important in this uh, in this setting. So, and then obviously we do have now, you say, okay, fine, preoperatively, we don't have anything in the, in the, in the, um, in the central compartment in terms of lymph node uh, involvement, but then you do have one of these tumors, uh, then we'll probably need to kind of then think, have a little think about the central compartment. And certainly the evidence that, uh, that uh, we, do we do have, and, and this is a, a paper about the decision-making of that uh, central compartment. Uh, and this is actually by, by colleagues that, uh, uh, from around the world. Uh, and is that, is that if we do have that sort of kind of suspicious extrathyroidal extension, then patients are more likely to benefit from, uh, from uh, elective central compartment neck dissection. And therefore that's something that we need to uh, address. And then finally, it's just about how, how we deal with that. If the nerve is involved, we need to resect it. Um, how we do deal with that reconstruction? When is the best time to do the reconstruction? Um, this is again, another, another international collaboration uh, with people from, from the States and, 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 and Europe. Um, uh, and then I think the, the, although we do have low level uh, evidence, uh, uh, because it's a slightly uh, niche kind of uh, 
um, uh, 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 situation, um, uh, I think all the evidence suggests that if the nerve has to be sacrificed, then the best way to deal with it is by doing intraoperative um, immediate reconstruction. Uh, and, and that can be done with anticervicalis, um, which is the, the, the nerve that is, is, is more often available. Uh, however, if you do have a problem because you have a very invasive tumor, uh, uh, and then you need to resect, for instance, the strap muscles, and then you, the answer is actually gone, then we have used um, uh, a vagus nerve, uh, and sometimes not the full vagus, um, but sometimes just half a vagus. Um, and then sometimes that can be done even bilaterally. And I just finally, just to say that this is one of those, those patients, this is Biljana, uh, and I'd just, uh, I'd like you to, in the next minute, to, to hear what she's got to uh, what she's got to say. My operation was 16. Oh, no, yes. Hi, Viljana. Hi. I'm going to start talking now. Okay. Hi. How are you? Fine. Very well. Uh, my operation was uh, 16th of June, uh, uh, 2000 of uh, this year. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, uh, after the surgery, I uh, my voice. I lost my voice for a period of time. But the, thanks to Dr. Simo. I got it back in very short period, like in uh, two months, I was back to my 70% of the voice and I could maintain it all during the day. Uh, uh, now, one month later, I'm back 85 to 90%. I don't lose my voice whatsoever, even when I get tired. I don't know what did help me. The speech therapy did help a lot. And also uh, maybe my running, I don't know. But uh, the, the main reason that I my voice is like this today is that so it's the same. <laughs> so she was very obviously uh, very complimentary. Uh, this is the uh, her interpretive uh, um, uh, uh, nerve involvement. Um, uh, this is actually from live node involvement, but we did a, 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 a uh, an answer. Uh, she had very unpleasant tumor, and uh, but uh, at three months she was running, uh, which is actually really quite remarkable. Um, and then uh, 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 hopefully the voice, uh, or certainly everything that we do have, suggests that um, uh, uh, the voice will be uh, normal uh, at one year. My so in conclusion, uh, I, I say uh, that uh, the uh, small, well differentiated uh, thyroid cancers arising from that posterior aspect of the thyroid gland with uh, extra thyroid station should not be considered. I think is a really uh, an important statement, um, and I do com completely concur with it. Uh, that the preoperative evaluation in that suspicion should be tried to, com be, to combine with cross-sectional uh, high-quality imaging uh, uh, and then getting that opinion from that, that, that radiologist. That the recurrent angel nerve should be appropriately addressed with meticulous surgical technique, and I think that's really, really imperative. Uh, and then if we do have to deal with the, the recurrent angel nerve uh, and that we need to resect it, then the intraoperative immediate reconstruction uh, should be always available and, and considered by, by the surgeons. I think having kind of deferred um, uh, 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 reconstruction is, is not advisable um, if, if, if that can be done at the time of the, the, the first surgery. And then, of course, uh, that uh, for these patients, we will need to uh, consider combined modality treatment with very iodine. Um, and, then, and then it is, uh, again, uh, just going back to basics, that uh, in my view, these patients should be de dealt with uh, with, uh, with experience uh, multidisciplinary uh, teams um, uh, from the endocrine, uh, the, the oncology and the surgical uh, side. So that's what I have to say. And hopefully we can uh, establish some of the discussion now. Thank you. Terrific, uh, <clears throat> Ricard, thank you. Samantha, thank you very much. Um, truly appreciate it. And um, I would definitely like to open up for questions. Um, there, I have a feeling that these questions will uh, span uh, everything from the specifics of this paper as well as uh, related to, um, uh, uh, to active surveillance. So on that note, uh, the first question uh, relates to the management of um, or the decision to do active surveillance if a small central compartment lymph node appears to be suspicious. Um, and uh, you've got an otherwise appropriately, um, or a microcarcinoma that appears to be suitable for an active surveillance approach. Um, how do you make that decision, uh, Samantha, if you want to um, uh, comment on that? Sure. Um, 
a little bit uh, depends on um, uh, the the it's a small I, I assume in this case it's a small well located microcarcinoma is is the lymph node capable of being biopsied um, if the lymph node is capable of being biopsied I'd be very reassured by a negative biopsy um, because if we're going down the surgery if we're assuming that it's positive and going down the surgery route that's not a small surgery that is a that would be a, a central neck dissection as well um, which I uh, would not necessarily be ideal if, um, if that lymph node is not positive. Um, if the lymph node is not capable of being biopsied, I would potentially still watch it, um, but a little bit uh, more closely. I'd probably image in the months to uh in the in the weeks re-image in the weeks to months range do um possibly more aggressive imaging strategies like a ct scan um but if you can be reassured with a negative biopsy of that lymph node that would be much more comfortable with the surveillance strategy great um what about uh ricard what about you um does the presence of a lymph node that looks suspicious by ultrasound uh change your approach for that patient yeah, I mean, I think I think we, we do have a slight different approach, perhaps in the in Europe than than it is in the states. I think we are probably more aggressive surgically. Um, I think the, if this uh, if that such a patient would be uh, would be uh, uh, if we do have kind of proof that 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 cancer is is uh, is is a cancer um, on finding last operation cytology, then we'll probably invariably will 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 uh, advise that patient to have uh, to have surgery, and then obviously we deal with the uh, with the uh, with the with the, with central compartment so in general we tend to kind of be more leaning towards uh, surgery for these patients of course you will be, then have a problem with a with a patient in which this this in this this small cancer has been detected uh, because of kind of factor surveillance of other cancers for instance and the patient has got a lot of comorbidities uh, and is all, um, an elderly patient and in those cases we will probably then um uh, offer patients, you know, continuous active surveillance in the same way that that, that the Samantha is actually uh, addressed. But 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 in general, the majority of kind of fit patients on a primary setting will probably be more aggressive. Uh, and it, it is just a, a general consensus. I think it will be very difficult to 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 just to do active surveillance in that group of patients in in, in certainly in the United Kingdom. So along those lines, um, maybe uh, if you both could comment on. Um, your strategies for follow-up, um, this always comes up. How soon do you do your, your next ultrasound, either on a suspicious or um, on a patient who does have a confirmed biopsy who you would like to do active surveillance? What's your, your follow-up schedule look like, um, Samantha? And then maybe, Ricard, you could uh, comment on that. So... This is definitely still an area of practice that I'm um, working out. Um, however, um, if someone has, so if someone just has a suspicious nodule that is in a, um, uh, a, a low risk location, um, I'm okay with, and they, and they are, it's small and they're very adverse to surgical management. I would follow them yearly. Um, if they have a small suspicious nodule in a uh, concerning location, uh, such as one of the ones that we discussed, um, I would uh, push for the biopsy. And then if they were very adverse to that, I would follow every six months, um, if, you know, in any, uh, in any case, um, if they have a nodule that is large, larger, or um, the a nodule that is growing quickly, um, so if in between uh, it, they were previously getting a, a nodule monitored yearly and it doubled in size, um, I would definitely be pushing for a biopsy. Um, and I might even, and if they were unwilling, even potentially uh, image every three months, more more on the three to six month size. And then if it continued to grow, really, that's when the ENT referral would probably come. Um, but somewhere between six months and a year, depending on specific patient characteristics. Um, if something has been biopsied, one to two times and is completely Bethesda two, 
all the way um, and not growing over many years, I will space out my ultrasounds to two years. Uh, Ricard, you've yeah. got a patient with a suspicious nodule, um, biopsied or not biopsied, um, in a favorable location um, for active surveillance. When's your, when's your next ultrasound um, for follow-up? Well, we, in, in the UK, we are bound to, um, to, to do a fine needle aspiration cytology on that patient. So we don't rely only on ultrasound. I think uh, we, 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 but basically that's the, that's the way we, we do operate. We'd like to, uh, because they, I guess that the, uh, the ultrasonographic uh, expertise is very variable. Certainly in our center is actually very good, but we would like to kind of uh, complete um, uh, that first evaluation with both. And, and that's the standard of care that we do have in the UK. So let's just say that the patient has got a proven uh, small papillary, uh, one centimeter central, uh, and the patient doesn't want surgery for A, B, or C, uh, then we will uh, follow that up. Uh, for the first two years, we will do a six months follow up. Uh, if, if something appears near, we will probably FNA that. And if it stays, if it remains the same, we'll do another six months appointment uh, uh, for. Uh, and then what we also do is we will um, ask the same radiologist to do to do the, uh, we don't do, uh, very few people do uh, endocrinologists. They do have, we have from endocrinologists doing ultrasound, but basically the, from the head and neck side of things, we do have a dedicated radiologist. And we also, for a specific patient, we pick up the specific radiologist so they can have a, a specific um, uh, 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 comparisons uh, in, 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 the, in the interval. So we will be uh, basically for the first year, uh, unless something happens uh, every six months, uh, and then depending on the, uh, on the, on the, on the growth, good growth rate, uh, or if everything is stable, then we will uh, space that um, up to a yearly. And that's what we normally tend to do with the patients, for instance, who have had a um, that scenario where there's been, a, you know, they're elderly and they had a, uh, they they were being followed up by lymphoma or whatever, and then they 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 have that incidental finding, um, and uh, and then they don't want obviously any surgery for for very obvious reasons. That would be the approach that we use. So. Let me just uh, follow up on that question. What is, are there any size criteria um, for performing a biopsy in the United Kingdom? Uh, yes, we do now um, because, uh, you know, the, there's been, uh, there's, there's a lot of controversy. I think we, we are a little bit behind you guys in, in terms of kind of how we follow. We do, we do always watch uh, what you do, put in your guidelines, and then we, we take, tend to kind of adapt it. So uh, uh, we do uh, now, um, uh, uh, or tend to kind of biopsy things that are between uh, five uh, uh, millimeters and one centimeter. Anything below that, we will tend to not to. Uh, whereas you, you for instance, you do not advise to to to, uh, to FNA anything that is actually less than one centimeter. We do so, uh, and then we we had, for instance, occasions where we had uh, kind of very adverse. Uh, a type of histologies and in, 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 in 0.9 uh, uh, centimeters, for instance. So, so be, if if it is in a favorable location and the patient uh, uh, is is willing to, we'll normally kind of anything that's above uh, uh, five millimeters, we will we will uh, FNA just to just to for, conf for confirmation, uh, and and then we'll obviously make that decision um, uh, in the in the in the board. Okay, um, thank you. So. Um, Samantha, um, you bring up the you brought up at the beginning of your presentation the quality of ultrasound um, for adopting a uh, as one of the parameters for adopting active surveillance as a strategy. Um, that gets a little bit dicey when you think about a lifetime of active surveillance and the mobility of the um, you know of patients and the commitment to come back to see you uh, for the rest of their life. Um, how do you how do you actually bridge that divide? It's impractical. There are changes in insurance, all of the things that could interfere with a patient's ability to return to see you um, for the next fifty to sixty years. How do you how do you actually build that into your uh, decision making? Because um, as as you alluded to, uh, quality of ultrasound is a very very different um, uh, sort of animal, um, depending on who the operator is that's uh, performing it. For sure. Um, so this is sort of, I guess, a little bit of my own personal opinion and uh, we, not addressed in the paper, but I, I don't know how appropriate younger people are for an active surveillance strategy. 
um if you're under age 50 or 60 and you have a suspicious um nodule um i don't know what i don't think it's particularly practical to observe it for 40 years right i i um uh i think that um you either have to make a decision that after five to ten years of not moving to either stop following it or really uh very much uh uh peel back on your frequency of imaging or that's a reason to be more aggressive in a younger age group because they have um a longer period of uh, time for management um i agree uh ideally as dr simo uh, also referred uh referenced yes in a perfect world the same tech would do the ultrasound the same uh radiology department would be um you know uh and the same machines would be used it's kind of no different than how we have variation in our bone density scans that we see in the endocrine side for osteoporosis the operator uh technique is so different um but i do think that's a limitation of active surveillance and i do think it, it in some ways excludes younger patients for uh from this management strategy i know that you know what i've sort of kind of uh, the strategy that i've adopted personally is that if someone is very young we and what the way i'm conveying it to patients is we may be able to monitor this for a period of time but not for decades right we may be if if now is not a good time for you to have surgery for whatever reason you are childbearing you are uh you know getting married you are it is work related for you then we can monitor this because it is a low risk papillary thyroid cancer for the next five to seven years i i don't know yet what the place is for long-term monitoring of these nodules um and i'm not sure for people under age 60 that it, it is practical um, because uh, for all the reasons that you said, financial, uh, you know, practical location, things like that. Great, all right, terrific. And I think that's very practical um, advice here. While you're on that topic, what are your, how do you deal with TSH suppression uh, for patients that you are actively surveilling? Do you have any thoughts on that? I, so I don't typically suppress the TSH in people who I am actively surveilling. Um, I shoot, especially in this same younger population, I sh would shoot for a, a, a lower TSH, but I'm not um, totally familiar with any data that confers benefit to TSH suppression for a small papillary thyroid cancer in terms of preventing growth. Um, I will, um, I will sometimes check antibodies um, in these patients to see if they have an underlying Hashimoto's.